Today is a special day. It is a Mother's Day. The role of a mother in a family is very significant. From giving birth to a child, to taking care of the baby, and even educating the children, teaching them lessons. The mothers spend most of their time in kitchen preparing food for the family. Especially there are mothers who work outside and they come and even take care of the family. During this lockdown time, I read of a mother who went more than thousand kilometers on her two-wheeler to bring her daughter from another city. What a great sacrifice and love. The mother is a very caring person. That's why God calls himself as a mother. He says, I'll comfort you as a mother comforts her child. And even if your mother forgets you, I will not forget you. So mothers are very important in our lifetime. That is why we take this time and this day to celebrate them, to appreciate what they are doing for them. Let me talk to the mothers for a minute. You are a special creation of God. In the Bible, we see a beautiful mother who is the mother of Moses. When the Pharaoh had said to throw all the boy children into the river, she was a woman of faith and she hid the child for three months. Why? She believed God is able to protect. Woman of faith. Secondly, she makes a basket of reeds, puts the child into that place and puts the basket into the river. Isn't it uh, dangerous? Yes, it is. But she believed that God had a plan for the baby. You know, all the efforts that you're taking, dear mother, by praying for your family, shedding tears for your family, and all the efforts that you're making that your family should become spiritually strong, is never forgotten. God is looking at that. You know, when Pharaoh's daughter came and saw she had favor for the baby Moses and she calls Moses mother and gives the baby to be taken care of. We see that Moses mother grows him up in the ways of God that when he grew up as a great man, he became the deliverer of Israel from the bondage in Egypt. What does it show? Dear mother, your effort and your labor to bring your family into God's plan will never go in vain. Keep believing, keep praying, keep making efforts, the Lord will reward you. And now I want to say a happy Mother's Day to you. May the Lord bless you, all the mothers out there, not only physical mothers, especially spiritual mothers who feed us with the word of God and who lead us in the ways of God. We want to honor you in a double way. And for the rest of the family who are watching this video, I want to tell you, take a time to appreciate your mother, your mothers in the family by cooking a meal for them or making a dish, or at least make a cup of tea for your mom or make a group photo as a family and give her. She'll be happy about that. Let us remember, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us serve the Lord as a family. Again, signing off by wishing the mothers a very happy Mother's Day. Welcome to this beautiful time of uh, hearing the word of God. God really blessed us today on this wonderful occasion. Uh, occasion to praise and worship Him and uh, even greet the mothers on the Mother's Day today. But today I want to share with you something God uh, laid on my heart for the past uh, season. It has been very strong upon my heart and becoming stronger. You know, we are in a time, you know, at the end of this uh, lockdown, uh, many things are becoming apparent. Now it's uh, almost... Uh, going to be uh, more than 50 days and in some places it's going to be closer to 53, 54 days before the lockdown will be 
through. And uh, when they started the lockdown, maybe they were in, the, in a process. Maybe they were wanting to do something. Uh, maybe uh, it was about their job. It was about a construction they were making. It was about a business they were proceeding. And suddenly, this disaster hits and the pandemic and everything goes into a, a silent uh, zone. And now, things are beginning to reopen. Many people are going to make decisions. Many are faced with a valley of decision. What should I do? Should I proceed? Should I not proceed? Should I wait? So all these kinds of questions are going to be, uh, you know, it's going on in the minds of people. Even you, as you're listening to this message, you have a, a same kind of a thing in your mind. You know, I want to... Uh, tell you that God really wants to talk to you because this message is going to be um, how to know the mind of God or knowing the mind of God. Acts chapter 1, when we read verse 6 and 7, the disciples had a similar question when Jesus died and rose again. They asked him in verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And verse 7, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now the disciples wanted to know whether to put it in a very blunt way, the millennium was just about to begin. That is the thousand year rule which was prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. You know, because Jesus had now died and he has rose again, he has defeated death and he has all power, they could see it, they could verify it. So they were all excited that the millennium or the thousand year rule was just about to begin. Jesus had to clarify at that moment. So they had a question of what the future is going to be. But Jesus had to tell them, you know, he didn't tell them a blunt no because they couldn't uh, take it. He knew that. Uh, so he put it in a very polished way saying that it is not good for you, you know, like talking to a child. He was telling to know what the father has in his authority. Obviously, then he says, this is the time you will receive the Holy Spirit. Go and preach the gospel to all the Gentiles. What would have happened if Jesus had told, no, uh, it is going to take another 2,000 years before the millennium will come. You think Peter would have gone and preached? You think the apostles would have gone and uh, preached the gospel? No, no. They would have all kind of got tired and they would have got disappointed. But the Lord gave a good answer. And today I want to tell you that these times you are having a question regarding a decision that you are going to make. But God wants to reveal his purpose in your life. He wants to show you what to do next. He wants to show what is his will for your life, in your job, in your business, in uh, something concerning, uh, you know, the marriage of your son or your daughter. God wants to talk to you or maybe even your own marriage. And uh, to set yourself up to know the mind of God. So that is why this message is knowing the mind of God. I'm going to give you three keys very uh, briefly. The first key is from the life of a man called as Abraham. Abraham was met by God one day during a hot summer day. And Abraham was running about to serve the Lord. In fact, the Lord came with two angels. And uh, after Abraham had served food, uh, and the Lord said an astounding statement in Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? So God is saying something I cannot hide Oh, my plans from Abraham. Isn't it amazing? God was compelled 
to reveal the future to Abraham. And he speaks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. My question is, even Lot was a righteous man. The Bible ascribes or it tells that Lot was righteous. But God did not reveal the destruction of the city where Lot was living to Lot. But he reveals it to Abraham. Isn't it amazing? Lot should have actually known that the city was going to be destroyed. But it was Abraham who was given the revelation. Why? What did God see in Abraham that God revealed the future to him? It's very interesting because knowing that we can also put ourselves into that position which God desires from us, that we can know the mind of God. In Genesis 17, God sp speaks to Abraham after a gap of 13 long years. Why? Because Abraham had made his own choice along with Sarah to get a child through Hagar, which was not at all God's will. And God became silent. Now, after 13 long years, God comes to meet Abraham and he speaks to Abraham saying in verse 1, uh, Walk before me and be blameless, for I am El Shaddai, or I am the Almighty God. So God was teaching Abraham something. Did Abraham learn it? Yes. How do you know? Genesis 17:17. 17, 17, talks about the position or the posture Abraham took to talk to God. God was just standing there and talking to Abraham. Abraham, did he stand and talk? Did he kneel and talk? No, it says. Then Abraham fell on his face. Abraham fell on his face. Now, God was telling Abraham, I'm going to make you a big a group of people. So, Abraham said, Lord, how, am I, how is it going to happen? You know, I'm an old man, 99 years old. My wife is old. But even those words, Abraham did not just speak out. He didn't come blurting out of his lips. No, he was down on his face. What does that mean? Abraham had learned what you call as reverence for God, reverence or fear of God. It's very important, you know, if we, if we need to know the mind of God, we better have the reverence for God. No matter, you know, people say that, oh, nowadays science has advanced, technology has advanced, uh, why should we think about things like fear of God and reverence? I want to tell you, let's think about this corona or the COVID-19 that has been caused by the virus. And uh, in spite of all advancements, military advancements, technology and science, man has learned to become more careful in the presence of this disease. Nobody takes things for granted. You're asked to wash your hands many times a day with a nice uh, soap uh, or, and uh, use the mask for face and uh, use social distancing and even not shake hands and so on and so forth. All talks about one thing. You can't be casual. <laughs> You have to be careful. And that's exactly the same, you know. In the things of God, you don't take things casually. Now, I don't mean that you have to be afraid in terms of uh, shuddering before a wild animal. No, no, no. When you come to God, you have the highest esteem for Him. You esteem Him greatly. You honor Him greatly. You honor the things of God so greatly. As psalmist says in 25, verse 12 and verse 14, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. 
Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. So it clearly says that reverence for God is the key to knowing the mind of God. Abraham knew the mind of God. God revealed the future to Abraham because Abraham showed himself as a man who had reverence for God. The second thing is another truth that we see in the life of Isaac. For God to reveal things in our lives, what is the second thing that we need? When we go to Genesis, we see the life of Isaac you can call it, you know, I want to call the life of Isaac as a life of tests. Even when he was 12 years old, Abraham was tested to put Isaac on the altar. Now Isaac was, should have been about 12 years old. He could have even escaped and ran away because he, he was seeing his father doing something which is totally kind of insane, kind of nonsense. But Isaac silently submitted himself to that testing moment, believing that God will always do good for him, even as a 12-year-old child. When we look at his life later, in Genesis chapter 26, we see that there was a famine in the land where Isaac, Rebekah, his wife, and uh, even all the animals that they, they, they were having. But he was thinking to go to Egypt. And God appears to him and tells him, if you read in verse 2 of Genesis 26, Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. In verse 3, dwell in this land. I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Now he says, or oh God reveals what's going to happen. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your generations. I'm going to give you all these lands, but there's a test. You have to live in this land. Yes, there is famine here. Yes, there is no rain. Human sense will tell somebody, without rain, there is no grass. Without grass, there is no fodder for the cattle. And the cattle will die. But when God says, dwell in this land... Isaac chose to believe God against all odds. And that is the requisite number two. If God needs to reveal his mind and his will for you, there are times when God will tell you things that sounds crazy to the human mind, that sounds folly to the human mind. People might laugh about it. People might joke about it. People might say, you're digging your own pit. It's not going to work. But Isaac made a choice and stayed because he wanted to trust God even in the midst of the test. And the result was, we see in the same chapter, verse 12, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Amen. He sowed in that land. Now Isaac was not a farmer. He was a cattle rearer. Now God gives him a new revelation. I believe that happened because Isaac chose to uh, pass the test by obeying God. Even when it seemed making no sense. And God gives him a revelation of sowing seeds. Result is hundredfold increase. Now that is agricultural breakthrough. Maybe the father of agricultural science is Isaac. And that's why Israel is an agriculturally developed uh, 
country. And the Bible even says in the next verses that he waxed and grew great and became so popular, prominent. He had so many cattle and so many servants, all in the midst of famine. Child of God, if you want God to show you what decision you need to make, you have to make one decision. That is, whatever God is telling me, I'll just put my foot down, close my eyes and say, Yes, Lord, I believe I submit myself. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job gives a beautiful uh, truth in that verse. Sometimes when God tells us it might be so different, we are not able to understand the purpose of why he is leading us in a particular situation, in a particular direction at that moment. But you believe it because Job says, but he knows the way that I take. That's all is enough. You know, if God knows what he is asking you to do, just do it. Because in the end, he says, when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Hallelujah. What a powerful truth is that. And thirdly, we see another man called as Jacob, who is the son of Isaac. And we see how God revealed his mind to Jacob. Now we know Jacob had received both the birthright and the blessing. And Esau, his brother, was very angry and he wanted to kill uh, Jacob. So Jacob was uh, sent away by his parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Now, he was running for his life. Imagine his condition, his situation with a lot of fear. And uh, running to his uncle's house and hundreds of kilometers he had to go. But while he was staying in a place in the wilderness, God reveals to Jacob one night in a dream of what is going to happen in the future of Jacob's life. In that dream, there was a ladder that was set from earth to heaven. God was on top and angels were ascending and descending. You can read about this in Genesis 28 verses 12 to 15. And you can see that God was sending a lot of promises of what is going to happen in Jacob's life. First of all, the Lord said that he is the God of Abraham and Isaac, uh, his fathers. And he says that I'm going to give you this land wherever you're sleeping. And then he says that I will be with you wherever you go. I will keep you and I will bring you back. And he says how he will bless him. So God was revealing his mind concerning Jacob. And God finally finishes his, his uh, uh, discourse by saying, I will not fail you until I have done all I have spoken to you. And that is verse 15, uh, the end of verse 15. So God revealed his mind, what was going to happen in the life of Jacob. Why should he reveal to Jacob? After all, Jacob had nothing at that moment. He was, a no, he was seemingly a nobody running for his life. There was one thing that Jacob had that brought the attention of God upon Jacob's life. If you read earlier on in, in Genesis chapter 25, when Esau and Jacob were growing up, you can read in verse 27 to 34, there is an incident given. Esau becomes a hunter who wanders everywhere for food. Jacob dwells in the tent and the Bible calls him a complete man. In other words, a man of character. Jacob was more concerned about his spiritual life Whereas Esau was concerned about his physical life and physical needs. As days went by, one day Esau did not have anything to hunt. So he came back empty. Jacob was cooking lentils 
and uh, red stew. So Esau asked for food. And we know that Jacob said, give me your birthright. Now birthright was God's special grace. You can even call it as God's special anointing or empowerment for the firstborn. And Jacob wanted that. Now es Esau could have very well said, no, I won't give you. But you see what Esau tells, yes, I will give you. What is the use of this birthright? I am dying of hunger. Esau put the physical need in the front. He despised the spiritual blessing. Whereas Jacob had a heart for the spiritual blessing. In other words, he loved the Holy Spirit. He loved the anointing. He loved the presence of God. And in the end, he got what he loved he received what he desired. Child of God, you want God to reveal things in your life, reveal about your future, reveal about what you should do next, reveal God's plan for your life, for your work, for your business, for your next step. Let me tell you, child of God, you need to do one thing. Love the Holy Spirit. Love the things of the Spirit. Walk with the Holy Spirit. Spend time with God. You know, one of the beautiful things that we can do is these days is spending time with Him by praising Him and worshipping Him and telling Him of our love. No matter whatever we are doing, we can still love Him by worshipping Him. Walk close with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will definitely reveal things to you. He revealed to Jacob. And exactly whatever God told Jacob, it was fulfilled 20 years later. Jacob becomes a great, great nation called as Israel. We never find God speaking to Esau. Never. Why? He never loved the relationship with the Holy Spirit. In fact, he despised the grace and the anointing. And I want to tell you, as I close, you know, I want to share a scripture from, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The last verse. Let me just read it for you. Because God has spoken to us these three things of how you can know the mind of God. Number one, by greatly esteeming God, honoring God with all your heart. Number two, trusting God even when what God tells you doesn't make any sense for you. And number three, when God will reveal things to his children, when you walk closely to him, closely with him by the relationship with the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 2, the last verse Paul writes, For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now I want to tell you, you can know the mind of God through these three things. Can we just take these words and put it in our hearts and begin to apply? Will you make a commitment today? I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. Thank you for the presence of your Spirit. Even in the, in the midst of these days when, Lord, your children are facing the valley of decisions. There are multitudes who want to make decisions concerning so many, many, many things. And Lord, with, the, with a great love for your children, today you have spoken, Lord, that they can make the right decision, which is according to the will of God. Lord, even as you have spoken how to position to receive your guidance, I pray you will give that grace to your children that each of them will position themselves through reverence, through trust, and through walking with the Holy Spirit. And in the end, they will see you revealing your plans for their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Even as I pray, God is showing me something like a a Rubik cube, which is like a cube which the children get to play. It has squares of different colors. But the people who are professionals, they can align the same color on each side. The Holy Spirit is saying that things might seem to be totally out of place. But the Holy Spirit is saying, as you fix your eyes on me, and as you do these things that I've taught you today, I will beautifully align your life. And I will turn your ashes into beauty and my beautiful plan of your life for your life will be completely fulfilled. Thank you, Lord, for you're going to do it, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Continue to bless and protect your children. May they walk in the knowledge of your ways. May they know your mind. May they see your blessings. May they be a blessing. I pray whatever decision that they are, Lord, waiting to take, you will give them absolute clarity and they will walk in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us forever and now. Amen.